my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, but no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name.
Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20 is where we'll spend our time together this morning. In a few moments, I'm going to read to you the first 12 verses of Luke 10, but we'll stay down through verse 20. So go ahead and find that in your copy of the Bible. If you're new to the Bible, Luke is not too hard to find. It's right there at the beginning of your New Testament. You can find the four Gospels. Luke is the third Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you did not bring a Bible with you this morning, there should be a Bible down in front of you in the book rack, right in the seat before you. Grab that Bible and find Luke's Gospel with us. With us. If you don't own a Bible, uh, take that Bible home with you. Read it. God that loves you and desires a relationship with you. Luke chapter 10 verses 1 through 20 is where we are this morning. If you are new to Northwood, what we'd like to do in our church is take books of the Bible like Luke's gospel and just walk right through them chapter by chapter. And, and we believe that God speaks to us through his word. And so we're believing this morning as we study this text together, God is going to speak to us. Now I tell you, I really am thankful for what God is doing in the life of our church. You think about the number of kids who were here this week for VBS and how this week many of our adults were on mission right here in our church, loving on those kids and sharing the gospel with them. I think about the team that's in Boston, the team that's in West Virginia, the team that will go to Dominican Republic uh, next month and the team that will go to Japan in, in August. I mean, it's just really neat to think about all of these different opportunities that God has given us to serve and how, how people are doing it, how people are serving on his mission. Think about next Sunday night and we'll have just lots and lots of people here that we'll be able to bless through a fireworks show and we'll share the gospel with. I mean, it's just really really, really encouraging. And I, I don't know, maybe in this room, a lot of you have been on a short-term mission trip before where you've left the Charleston area. Maybe you've gone overseas or, or to a different state to do some type of mission work. The, the, the first mission trip I went on was to Russia years ago and, and went back and forth to Russia uh, quite a few times. And, and you also probably know, I've told you before about some of my experiences in China. I remember when I went to China uh, for the very first time, it was interesting. So the, the, the city I went to in China for the very first time, I took a team of, I don't know, seven or eight people. And it, the, the city was Chinyang. And Chinyang is a city of about eight million people. That's a big city, right? I mean, you think about eight million, I think that's a little bit larger than New York City. We don't have lots of cities in the States that are that big. But in China, that's like an average city, eight million people. That's a lot. Can you imagine the traffic? That's a lot of people. And so, so we went there and, and when we were in Chinyang that first time, Jared, some of you've met Jared before. I've had him here to speak a couple of times. We were there with him and, and he sent the team in one direction and sent me by myself in another direction. He wanted me to go and meet with some house church leaders and, and to do some theological training and those kinds of things. And so, so he, he took a notepad and wrote out instructions for me, like on how to get a taxi and, and how to get to the subway and how to buy my subway ticket and how to get on the subway and what stops to look for and all those kinds of things. And so, so here I am and, 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 and ready to get out that morning and on my own, try to find this apartment somewhere in Chinyang where I would be leading this discussion on theology. And so I, I got up and, I, and, I, and I, I got the taxi and I got to the, uh, the place where the subway was. And, and, and a couple of things were interesting to me. One, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but like in China, they speak Chinese. And, and, and so, so like, there's no English. And so trying to figure, I mean, I had instructions written out in English, but when I got to the subway, I had to buy that ticket. And the machine wasn't in English, it was Chinese. And so trying to follow the instructions and make sure I hit the right buttons and, and then to walk down there and to, to try to, to, to find that particular subway I was getting on and, and to look up and see where it was going. I couldn't read any. I mean, have you seen the Chinese language before? I mean, it, it makes no sense. I mean, and so I'm trying to figure this thing out. And, and, and by the grace of God, uh, a young Chinese, man came up to me who just wanted to practice his English, which I was at that point very glad somebody wanted to speak English to me at all. And so, so he started talking and he told me what to do. He helped me get on the subway. And I, all, all that to say, I finally got to the destination, uh, but even get on the subway, I got a picture of the subway. It was wild. Like, like in China, I don't know if you know this or not, there's no such thing as personal space. Like everybody is on top of you. I mean, it's just a different kind of experience. And I, and I remember being there for the first time and I've gone back a number of times since then. But that first time being there, I remember the feeling that I had trying to find that place I was going to on my own in a different country where I didn't know the language. I was overwhelmed. Now, not only was I overwhelmed trying to find where I was going, I was overwhelmed just in general 
To think about all that these believers have gone through over the years and to think about how the Christian church in China has gone through much persecution. It was an overwhelming thought. And, and to think about the number of people in that country who don't know Jesus, it was overwhelming. Overwhelming. And, I, and I think about these teams of missionaries that we've sent out this summer to, to various parts of the country and uh, ultimately across the world when we go to Dominican Republic and Japan. They're, I think, going to come back saying, man, it was good, but it was overwhelming. I think about the work we do right here in Charleston. Come on now. The work that God has called us to in this city, it's overwhelming. I mean, think about it, Right. Uh, we, we in, in, in this particular area, in North Charleston, within five miles of our church, there, there's about 60 or 70,000 people and they ain't going away. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like more and more are coming. I mean, I, I guess over the next few years, who knows what it'll be. I mean, you think traffic's bad now, just wait. But, but within five miles of this church, 60 to 70,000 people. Now we're a fairly large church, but there's a whole lot more of them than there are of us. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's overwhelming to think that God has called us to reach the people around us. It's overwhelming to think that, that God has given us the responsibility within our church to disciple believers, to, to raise our children to follow Jesus well. I mean, it's overwhelming. I don't know about you, but when I think about the Christian life and, and all that God has called me to do in the Christian life, it is overwhelming. But not only that, I mean, I think about just life in general. Life is overwhelming. Some of you, because I, I know your stories, I know what's going on in your life this past year. For some of you, I'm overwhelmed just thinking about the things you've gone through because I know your lives are overwhelming. And so you think about what God's called us to do. I mean, that can be overwhelming. You think about your own life, that can be overwhelming. It just seems like we sometimes can live in this state of being overwhelmed. Can I just tell you something? I think God wants you to be overwhelmed. I think if you feel overwhelmed this morning, that's exactly what God wants for you. He wants you to feel overwhelmed by the mission that he's given us, uh, even by the, the things we go through in this life. I, I think God wants us to feel overwhelmed. And I, and I wanna show you why. As we walk through this text this morning, I wanna show you why God wants us to feel overwhelmed because the passage we're looking at this morning, it's an overwhelming passage of scripture. In fact, what I wanna do in this text this morning, I wanna show you three realities from this text that, that should overwhelm you because I think there's something that happens in your life and my life when we experience this sense of being overwhelmed by this life that God has given us. And I wanna show you that. So take your Bibles, look at Luke chapter 10, if you will. Luke chapter 10, uh, we're gonna read the first 12 verses together. So go ahead and rise to your feet as we honor the ring of God's word together. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He told them the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Now go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money bag, traveling bag or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this household. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they offer for the worker is worthy of his wages. Don't move from house to house when you enter any town and they welcome you. Eat the things set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. When you enter any town and they don't welcome you, go out into the streets and say, we are wiping off even the dust of your town that clings to our feet as a witness against you. Know this for certain, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than that town. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you that you're good to us. And Father, when we think about what you've called us to, the mission of God, it can be a bit overwhelming. And when we think about, Father, the, um, the just the circumstances of life, it can be overwhelming. And Father, I can't help but think you want us to be overwhelmed because in the overwhelmingness of life, you do a good work in us. 
And so, Father, if we feel overwhelmed this morning, I believe that we're exactly where you want us. And I, I, and I believe that right now you're going to speak to us. And as you speak to us, we want to listen carefully to what you're saying, and we want to listen with hearts that are ready to obey you. So help us now to listen carefully to your voice and help us to trust you and obey you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So here we are, we're in Luke chapter 10. And, and if you've been around for a while, you know that we obviously have ended Luke chapter nine. And Luke chapter nine really is in a lot of ways this, this pivotal moment in the gospel of Luke. Because in Luke chapter nine, Peter confesses, Jesus, you are the Christ. Luke chapter nine, the gospel writer wants us to know without a doubt who Jesus is. And, and, and you also know in Luke chapter nine, the story turns that Jesus is setting his face to Jerusalem. He is going to go to Jerusalem to die. And as he begins to make his way to Jerusalem, he says something like this to his followers. If anyone wants to follow me, deny yourself, Take up your cross daily and follow me. And so we, we said that Luke chapter nine, it begins to show us what discipleship really looks like. Denying ourselves, laying down our lives for the sake of the one who gave his life for us. And when you get to the end of Luke chapter nine, we saw last week some examples. Some examples of people who were hesitant to follow Jesus. But now you're in Luke chapter 10 and there's 72. 72 people that are not hesitant to follow Jesus. 72 people who are going to lay down their lives for the mission that Jesus has placed them on. Now, now this is interesting. So I want you to, to pay attention for just, well, actually pay attention the whole time. That'd be really helpful. But really pay attention now. So, so we've already seen something like this before. If you remember the beginning of Luke chapter nine, Jesus sent out who? The 12 apostles. Now here we are at the beginning of Luke chapter 10. Luke, um, Jesus is now sitting out 72. Now that's interesting. And so you're probably asking the question or you should be asking the question, why does Jesus send out 72 people? Well, I don't really know. I don't know and nobody really does know the, the, the exact answer as to why 72, but I, but I have a suspicion it may be because of this. Now, you know, 12 apostles, right? The 12 apostles, how many tribes of Israel were there? Do you remember? 12, right? 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. Now, think about this. In Numbers chapter 11, Moses is the leader. And in Numbers chapter 11, God speaks to Moses and says, okay, Moses, I want you to gather 70 elders, 70 leaders, and I'm gonna place a portion of my spirit on them and they're going to do this work with you. Moses, you're not going to do it alone. These 70 are going to do it with you. Now, come on. Here we are in Luke's gospel. I know it's 72, but it's the same idea. I think what's going on in Luke 10 is Jesus is reconstituting the people of God. This is what God wants. God wants his people to follow the king. Who's the king? The king is Jesus. And so Jesus gathers 12 apostles, right? 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. He gathers 70 people, 70 elders in the book of Numbers, 70 people he's going to send out here. And it's a reconstitution of the people of God. The people of God aren't those of a specific ethnic descent. The people of God are those people who are willing to take up their cross and follow Jesus. And so Jesus takes these 70 and he sends them out, or he's 72. Now, now look back at the text. Let me ask you a question. When you read through this passage, what are their names? We have no idea. We know the names of the 12 apostles, but even though we know the names of the 12 apostles, we don't know much about the 12 apostles. We know some tidbits here and there. But when you think about these 72 that Jesus sends out, we don't even know their names. All we know about them is that they go out. And when we get to the end of the passage, we know they come back. That's all we know. We are given no other information about them, which is kind of odd because these 72 that go out, I mean, if you think about it, they're what church? They are heroes of the faith. 
I mean, they do what Jesus tells them. And I think in a lot of ways, when you think about the 12 going out in Luke chapter nine and the 72 going out here in Luke chapter 10, it is preparatory for what's gonna happen in the book of Acts. We're preparing for that day when the spirit of God will come in Acts chapter two and send out his people to all the nations. So this is getting us ready for that. But if you think about it, the point being that this is a big deal. These 72 going out, they are heroes of the faith, but yet we don't even know their names. And if you think about it, that's the way it's supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, your name and my name doesn't really matter, right? Because here, here you are, you're in this room. And, and I know in this room, we, we have people that are, are newer to our church. You've been here maybe a couple years, maybe five years. Our church has been around for a long time. Over 50 years, we've been uh, existing as a church. And for a large number of those years, right here on this piece of property, serving in North Charleston, here's the reality. There's a lot of people who've been at our church that you don't know who they are. The saints who've, who've labored here in this place for the sake of the gospel, who've gone on to be with Jesus and you have no idea who they are. You don't know their names, but they laid a foundation of faithfulness. And, and, I, and I hate to burst your bubble, but there's gonna come a day that you die too. And, and the next generation of people who will be here at Northwood to serve God faithfully, they won't have a clue who you were. You see what I'm saying? But they'll know you're Jesus. Just like you know the Jesus uh, that those who came before us served. Because at the end of the day, come on, his name is the only name that really matters. And we labor not for our names, we labor for his name. You follow me, right? Now, this is where it gets interesting. Look back at the text. So Jesus sends out the 72. We've got to move fast, but look at what the text says. You come down and it says... Um, Jesus sent them out two by two and he sent them out to the places where he would go. And so he's making his way to Jerusalem, but he's still in the area of Galilee. Now watch what it says. He says, verse two, he told them the harvest is abundant, but the workers are what? Few, 72 of them. Now they're gonna go to places like Chorazin, Chorazin Bethsaida and Capernaum. How many people lived in Caper Capernaum, Bethsaida and Chorazin? I don't know the exact number, but it was a lot. So, so do you see? It's 72 of them and a lot of everybody else. He says, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Now look what, we'll come back in a minute, but look what it says in verse three. Now go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. You're gonna be attacked. There are gonna be some wolves out there who do not take kindly to your message and will want to destroy you because of your message. Do you see what he's saying? Jesus is saying to these 72, now watch, this is so good. You are outnumbered. There's only 72 of you. There's a lot of them. And you are overpowered. You're like a lamb going out among wolves. Now look what else it says. You come down and look at what it says in verse four. Don't carry a money bag traveling bag or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Don't take anything with you. Don't take a money bag. Uh, don't take an extra lunch. Don't take any sandals. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? And, and when you get to a house, I mean, just knock on the door and, and say, peace. They may let you stay there. They may not let you stay there. I mean, just go. So they're outnumbered. They're overpowered. And they're what church? They are under resourced. Now, come on. Do you ever feel that way? I mean, I, I know there's more of us than them. There's 72 of them. There's, there's lots of us who, who call this church home. But if you think about where we are in relationship to, to North Charleston, there's a lot of them and not a lot of us. We're kind of outnumbered in this community. Or you think about this, right? I mean, there's some, some ferocious people out there. In a lot of ways, we're overpowered too. And, and, and I know in a church like this, we, we've, we have more resources than the 72, but come on, we, we ain't got all the resources. I mean, we don't have a whole lot. We're, we're under resourced. And so if you think about it, I bet you these disciples that were being sent out in Luke chapter 10, they were overwhelmed by what they did not have. And you feel that way too sometimes. But now watch this. Look at what Jesus says. Come on back up. 
You come back up to verse two. He told them the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, what church? Pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. Now, here's where I wanna go with this. We should in this room feel overwhelmed, right? And here's why, listen to this. I think this text is showing us the reality. This text is showing us the reality on that first slide, if you don't mind, that you need to be overwhelmed by your inadequacy to serve Jesus well. That's a fact. You and I, and I, and I know you don't wanna hear this because, because you want to have your self-esteem built up, right? I mean, that, that's kind of who we are. You wanna be told that, man, just keep on doing a good job and all those kinds of things. But, but listen, I, I'm not here this morning to build up our self-esteem. I want you to see the reality. The reality is for the work that God has called us to do, you are, I am, we are what? We are inadequate. But here's why that's a good thing. Now watch this. Inadequacy drives you to prayerful dependence. When we recognize that we can't do this, that we can't live life well on our own, and we certainly can't live out the mission of God well on our own, what that should do. Now, come on. What that should do is that should drive us to come before our God in prayer, knowing that He is the one who has all the resources we need. He has all the power that we need. He has everything that we need to live for Him well on our own. Now, come on. We are a bunch of inadequate people, but with Christ working in us and through us, we have more than enough to accomplish what He wants for us in this life life for his glory. Do you follow what I'm saying? But, but here's the problem, and you know this. You know you're inadequate. But over the last week, how much time have you been, been spent praying about your inadequacies? How many times this week have you approached the throne, God, I can't do this without you. God, I know you want me to live on your mission. I know you want our church to live on your mission. We can't do it without you. You see, you see our lack of prayer right, oftentimes shows that we think we can do it on our own or, or our lack of prayer. Now watch this, and this is real heartbreaking. Our lack of prayer shows that we really don't care about living for God's will and his mission. You see what I'm saying? But when we understand what God's mission is and that we must do this thing that he's called us to, then what it should do when we recognize our inadequacy is drive us to the throne of God. God, we need your help. Inadequacy drives us to prayerful dependence. Inadequacy he frees us to follow Jesus' way. Now, come on, listen, what does he say? I'm sending you out as what? Lambs among wolves. Can I just tell you something? And I, and I know that you might have a hard time believing this. It's okay to be a lamb. And what, what we want to do is we want to be wolves. We want to be ferocious. We want to be mighty. We want to have the power. We want the strength, Right? We don't want to be lambs because lambs what, church? Lambs need to be led. Can I just tell you? It's more than okay to be led by God. It's more than okay to admit your weakness to God and say, I can't do this without you. I need you to lead me. It's more than okay for us as a church in the midst of all the good things that God is doing among us to come before him and say, God, you have been faithful and good. We wanna see more of your work, but we can't see more of your work without you working among us. It is okay to be led by the Spirit of God. In fact, if you want to live well for Christ, you must be led by the Spirit of God. It is okay to be a lamb. Now watch this. In Adequacy drives you to prayerful dependence. Inadequacy frees you to follow Jesus' way, which is being led like a lamb. And inadequacy helps you to focus on the message and those who need the message. Now, this is what's so interesting to me. Jesus tells these disciples to go where? To houses. Knock on the door and proclaim peace. The kingdom of God is here. Some of these homes will open themselves up to you and you stay there. Some reject and you go on. But look, go proclaim a message of peace. Now, let me ask you a question. See if you, you, you know the answer to this. By this point in the lives of the 72, how much theological training have they had? I mean, they're, they're still trying to figure out if we're honest who Jesus is. They understand that he's the Messiah, I think, and they, they get the fact that he's proclaiming the kingdom and they've seen Jesus change their lives in some ways, but, but they, they still don't have a very clear understanding and won't until after the resurrection of Jesus as to exactly what kind of Messiah Jesus is. So they don't know it all. 
How many of these 72 do you think were trained in apologetics? How many of them do you think had advanced seminary degrees? Here's what they had. They had a testimony. You follow? When they went to these houses, I mean, it's like, I don't have all the answers, but here's what I know. This guy I've been following, he is the Messiah. I've seen him do mighty works and I've seen him change my life. And I just tell you that to tell you, right? You don't have all the answers either. I mean, none of us in this room have all the answers. None of us, including me, are experts in apologetics. None of us, including me, are expert in the things of God. We're all learning and growing. But I want to tell you, if you've been saved by Jesus Christ, if you've seen him change your life, then you do indeed have a message to share. You have something to say to somebody because you are dead and now you're alive, you see. But yet we hesitate. We're fearful to share this message. And how, why is that? When you know that God is done something in your life. You see, in my inadequacy, I can come before God and say, I need you. And in my inadequacy, I can say, I don't have to have all the answers, but I do have the answer, Jesus Christ. And I can share that answer. Do you follow me? It's okay to be inadequate because that inadequacy leads you to the throne of God to cry out to him. I was uh, in Cambodia in 2019. That was the last mission trip I've been on because COVID changed everything and we're just now getting back to doing missions like we used to. And so I went to Cambodia with a buddy of mine uh, right before COVID back in November of 2019. And, and uh, Cambodia is an is a interesting place. I, I still don't know what I ate there and uh, all those kinds of things. And so, so, so I was there and we were training house church pastors, actually house church pastors from China that had come down for security reasons to Cambodia to be trained. And, 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 and so my buddy and I, uh, we, we've traveled several times times together to different parts of the world doing missions together, a real dear friend of mine. And as so we were walking uh, the streets of Cambodia one night and, and, and we came across a sight, an unexpected, unbelievable, one of the most beautiful sights I'd ever seen in all of my life. Look, go on the next slide. All right. I mean, come on. When you don't know what you're eating, and you don't know if what you're eating is going to stay in you or not. And then you see that sign. Oh, my friend. To taste that hot, warm, that glaze. You see what I'm saying? I mean, we want to go right now, don't we? I mean, it was like, like heaven came down and glory filled my soul. You understand? I mean, I mean, my, my life there in Cambodia was changing as I, as I took that, that Krispy Kreme donut. And, and that was a glorious sight to experience that. Now, that was a great sight. I didn't expect to see that in Cambodia. And here's something else I didn't expect to see. Look at this. These were everywhere. See what those are? Every house you went to, but not only every house, every hotel, every restaurant, the marketplace, everywhere you went, you saw these shrines for the household spirits. Because the idea there is that every house has spirits living inside of it. And so the spirits who live in your house need a house. Makes sense, doesn't it? And so what they would do in, in that culture is, is every day they would go out to these little shrines and they would put food out. You know, vegetables, rice, whatever the case may be. Now, I, the spirits didn't eat it, I don't know, but, 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 but still they would do that, right? Ancestry worship. And, and so there I was, you know, little Baptist preacher in Cambodia and seeing all this idolatry around me and then coming back to the States, realizing it's not shrines for us like this, but it's other things that we are surrounded by idolatry. All I'm trying to tell you is it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming to think about the lostness that's in this world. It's overwhelming to think that God has called someone like me and someone like you to push back the darkness as we share the truth. It's overwhelming. But there is the Spirit of God who lives in us, who's empowering, not empowering us, not to sit here and do nothing, but is empowering us to engage a lost world as we obey Him. Do you follow me? But look what the text says. So you have this overwhelming task and they experience the inadequacy, but look what happens and we gotta move. But you're used to moving. Look what it says. Jesus talks about how there's gonna be some that embrace 
these disciples and some that reject. And they're to shake the dust off their feet and walk on. But look what it says. You come down to the end of verse 11. He says, know this for certain, the kingdom of God has come near. And I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. For those who reject, it'll be more tolerable than Sodom. Now, here's what you know about Sodom. When you read the Old Testament, Sodom and Gomorrah, ain't anybody worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, right? But he's not done. Look what else he says. Woe to you, Chorazin, verse 13. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now, let me help you understand what's going on here. Tyre and Sidon in the Old Testament were pagan cities, right? That the prophets talked a lot about. But, but, but here's what Jesus says. Chorazin, Bethsaida, if Tyre and Sidon had seen the miracles you had seen, they would have repented a long time ago. You've seen all kinds of miracles and you have not repented of your sins. Now come down, look at what else it says. You come to verse 15, and you Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, he's speaking to the disciples. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, the one who sent me. Now, we're getting into a subject that none of us like to talk about, judgment. And listen to what Jesus is saying. He's speaking to three cities in particular, Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum. These cities were, were, were close together there in Galilee. And you know something about Capernaum. Capernaum was the home base of Jesus, wasn't it? That when Jesus was on this earth, during his earthly ministry, he lived in Capernaum. Chorazin and Bethsaida were close by. And Bible scholars call these three cities the evangelistic triangle. Why do they call it that? Because this is where Jesus spent a lot of time. So the people of Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum, what had they seen? A lot of miracles. What had they heard? A lot of teachings about the kingdom of God. What had they not done? Repented. And so what Jesus says, now watch this. Here's what I want you to see. I want this reality. You need to be overwhelmed not only by your own inadequacy, but you need to be overwhelmed by your knowledge of God's judgment. Because what Jesus is saying here is that God's judgment is unbearable. It's gonna be better for Sodom. It's gonna be better for Tyre and Sidon than for you, Chorazin, you, Bethsaida, you, Capernaum, who have seen me, heard me, witnessed me, yet have not embraced me. We don't like to talk about this, and I get it. And I, I certainly don't want to be that hellfire brimstone kind of preacher. But listen, this is reality. Because when we think about God's judgment, we think about people out there. You think about the murderer on death row. Man, he deserves judgment. You think about the serial child abuser. He deserves judgment. You have all kinds of people in your mind that you and I think of when we think about people who deserve judgment. But, but here's the reality. Now, now listen, now, I want to say this not in a hellfire brimstone kind of way. I want to say this in love. There are people in this room who are under the judgment of God. Because you're like the people of Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. You've heard it over and over again. You've seen testimony of the work of God's grace in the lives of people in this room. You, you, you don't lack for knowledge about the gospel. But yet, even though you don't lack for knowledge about the gospel, what you've never done is you've never repented. You've never actually turned from your sins and turned to Christ by faith. You see what I'm saying? You see, I know we don't wanna talk about this and I get it. It's not a comfortable subject to talk about, but the reality is, is that the Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that what we earn for our sin is death, eternal death, apart from the grace of God. That's what we all deserve. And there are people in this room, you're under the judgment of God because you've heard the truth of the gospel over and over again, but you have not chosen to turn from your sin. You Stay in your sin. And my friend, you are no different. The Bethsaida, Bethsaida, Chorazin, or Capernaum, you are under the judgment of God. Now, here's why I know what happens. When we begin to think about the judgment of God, a few things happen. One, 
But some of us ignore it. Like, preacher, that's, no, whatever. We just ignore this reality of God's judgment. Uh, some of us treat it flippantly, right? Like, yeah, I, I hear you preacher, but I don't know if I can buy that one. Nah, nah, mm. uh, some of us, right, try to rationalize it. Really? Judgment? God's love. I mean, so as long as I, right, live a pretty decent life and I'm, and I'm nice to my wife and my kids and I, and I do well at work, then, then at the end, I mean, certainly because God is love, I'll be okay because after all, God is love. But let me remind you that what Scripture reminds us of is that yes, certainly God is a God of love. That's why He sent His Son Jesus to die in your place and rise again from the dead. But also you have to remember that God is a God of what, church? Justice. You understand? And there is only one sacrifice that has paid the penalty for your sin and it's Christ Jesus. And to reject that sacrifice means that you remain under the judgment of God because he will deal with your sin. And I know we don't like to talk about that. We need to because now watch this. This judgment of God, it should motivate our gospel conversations. You have family members, friends, people that you love who are under the judgment of God, who if they do not turn to Christ by faith, will spend eternity apart from Christ. That is Bible teaching. I'm not making that up. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you, this is what the Bible tells us, right? And so if that's true, which it is true because we believe the Bible is true, then it is incumbent upon us to take this task, this overwhelming task seriously because we're overwhelmed by the judgment of God. Because we're overwhelmed by the judgment of God and His love and His grace, we go to people with a message of love and grace. You can experience something different than judgment. You can experience grace and mercy, forgiveness for all of your sins and life in Him. Do you see? Jesus is very clear. He comes with a message of love and grace, but he also comes with a message of judgment. To reject his love, to reject his grace means that you remain under the judgment of God. And so I just want to ask you, some of you need to wake back up so you can answer this question. What about you? Are you under judgment? Have you repented of your sins and turned to him by faith? I want you to be overwhelmed by the judgment of God if you're under his judgment, that it leads you to repentance. So, so listen, this text is reminding us to be overwhelmed by our inadequacy. It's reminding us to be overwhelmed by the judgment of God. But there's one more thing and we'll be done. You need to be overwhelmed, watch this. You need to be overwhelmed by the joy of living on his mission. Look how the text ends. Now, I know we're almost out of time, but come on in real close. Look, this is so good. I, I know this is a heavy passage. Dealing with our inadequacy dealing with the judgment of God. But, but listen, look at verse 17, so good. The 72 return with what, church? What? Come on, come on. There is joy. There is joy in being overwhelmed by the mission of God. There is joy in realizing your inadequacies and saying, I must depend on God. There is joy in doing what God tells. This is why. This is why you and I know people who, who lived lucrative lifestyles. We know doctors and lawyers and others, right? Who left those kinds of lucrative lifestyles to go serve on the mission field. We know people who, who later on in life, after they accomplished much, say, you know what? I'm just gonna go pastor a church somewhere. You see what I'm saying? We know those kinds of people. Why? Because people as they serve God, discover that serving God is far better than that being a doctor or a lawyer or the accomplishments. or whatever. Now, if you're a doctor, you need to do that well. But you know what I'm saying, right? That, that we understand that the greatest joy isn't found in our profession that gives us financial means. The greatest joy is found what? In simply obeying Jesus, right? So look, the 72 returned with joy. Was it hard for them? Absolutely. Had they experienced some rejection along the way? Absolutely. Did they feel inadequate? Absolutely. But they come back, how, church? with joy. Now come down, let me show you something else and we're gonna come back up. Verse 21, at that time, Jesus what? Rejoiced. Why is Jesus rejoicing? Because his disciples come back with joy. 
He sees them reveling in the work of God in their lives. Now come back up, verse 17, the 72 return with joy saying, Lord, this is interesting, even the demons submit to us in your name. Oh, so good. Verse 18, Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, just to give you an Old Testament reference, back in Isaiah chapter 14, back in Isaiah chapter 14, uh, Isaiah uh, gives us a vision of some powerful ruler that falls from heaven. Now, I think that Jesus is referring back to Isaiah chapter 14. And I think Isaiah 14 is, is a picture of the enemy, Satan himself. You see what I'm saying? And so Jesus is playing on that language. And now Jesus knows what's going to happen. He's seeing it happen in his life, in his ministry, and ultimately in his death and resurrection. He is going to defeat the enemy. The enemy is not going to defeat God's people. Do you follow? Because look at what Jesus says. Look, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. Now, 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 listen. Listen to what Jesus is not telling you. Jesus is not telling you to go home this afternoon and pick up a copperhead. That would be dumb. Don't do that. I'm telling you now, that's, don't do it, right? That, that's not what's going on here. Jesus is talking about what? That great serpent, the devil. And Jesus is saying, listen, I, he's falling. I'm defeating him through my death and resurrection. He will have no power over you. This is why, 72, you see demons come out. This is why they seem to submit to you because of the power of my death and resurrection over the enemy. But look at what it says. I mean, they're all excited. And you can understand why. I mean, if you've gone and cast out demons, you'd be excited too, right? It's kind of weird, but you'd be excited. But look what it says. That's so good. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Come on. I mean, it's awesome. It's awesome the work that God is doing in our lives. It's awesome when I have the opportunity to lead someone to faith in Christ. It's amazing when we're able to send out teams on mission. It's something to behold when we're able to have vacation Bible school and see a great number of kids come and see, see some of those kids place their faith in Jesus Christ. It's awesome to see our church grow. It's awesome when we'll have thousands of people here next Sunday night for a fireworks celebration and we'll get to share the gospel with them. It's awesome to experience all those things. But even more awesome is the thought that your name, your name, your name is written in heaven. Come on, come on, listen, 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 listen. What's the names? The 72, what are their names? You don't know their names, but God knows every one of those names. You're gonna die. Sorry, it's gonna happen hopefully a long time from now, but you're going to. And a hundred years from now, nobody on this earth will know your name. Doesn't change the fact it's written in heaven. God has always known your name. God will always know your name. You will always be his child. Yes, rejoice. Rejoice in the work that God is doing through his people. Rejoice in how God takes inadequate people like us and he empowers us by his spirit to accomplish his mission in this world. But rejoice even more in the fact that by the blood of Jesus Christ, who died in your place and rose again on the third day, who has forgiven you of all your sins, rejoice in the fact that because of his work, his work, not your work, not somebody else's work, but the work of Jesus Christ, praise God that because of that work, your name is now and forever written in heaven. Oh, praise God for his goodness to you, right? So now watch this. So what that means, and, and listen, I, I, I wish I could get more clever than this. I, I wish I had more for you than this, but this is all I got. If this is true, get your eyes on Jesus. And if this is true, get your eyes off of you. And if this is true, get your eyes on other. That's all I got for you. I mean, I wish I could give you seven practical steps to make this work in your life. But really, I've got one because, because I know this is a struggle. And I know that getting my eyes off of me is a struggle. And I know that getting my eyes on others and the mission of God, I know that's a struggle. That's why I think being overwhelmed is so helpful. 
Now follow me, just follow me real quickly and we're done. I think that probably the best way we can end our time this morning together, the best way we can respond to this message where God is showing us in his word that we are an inadequate, overwhelmed people who need to get our eyes on Jesus, who need to get our eyes off of ourselves and need to get our eyes on others for the sake of the mission. I think probably the best way we can respond in conclusion is as the people of God simply say to God, help us. Help us. Because we struggle. We struggle to keep our eyes on Christ. We struggle to live out this mission. Knowing that we have everything we need, knowing that the Spirit of God empowers us, we struggle. And I know for me, when I go back to what what Jesus says in, 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 in verse two, Therefore, pray. I struggle there too. And I know what I need this morning and what you need is to simply come before God now, tomorrow, the next day, and just to simply say to God over and over again, help me. Help me to get my eyes on you. Help me to know that you're more than enough. My eyes want to wander. My heart's prone to wander. Help me. Maybe as we close our time together, that needs to be your prayer. God, I'm inadequate. I'm overwhelmed. Help me. Maybe you're here this morning and as we've walked through the text together, you recognize that you're under judgment, that you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Today is a day of grace for you, a day to experience the day of the love of God because this morning, you can know that Jesus died in your place and rose again for you so all of your sins could be forgiven. And this morning, if you repent, turn from your sins and turn to him by faith, you can experience the gift of salvation and you can be his child forever. Your name today can be written in heaven. And so if you never placed your faith in Jesus, there's two crosses in the corner of this room. If you'll go to one of those crosses, somebody will be there ready to pray with you and help you begin a relationship with Jesus. I'll be down front. I'd love to talk to you and help you with that. If you're watching online, you're gonna see a number on the screen. Text the name Jesus, that number. We'll reach out to you. But today, let today be your day of salvation. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for time together in your word. Thank you that you are good to us. Now, Father, as we end our time together, I pray for that person in this room who's never placed his faith or her faith in Jesus, that person will come trusting you as Lord. Father, for the rest of us who are followers of yours, would you just help us today to say, God, help us. Help us in our overwhelmingness. Help us in our sense of inadequacy to realize that you are more than adequate for us. And we need you. So we can take our eyes off of ourselves and put our eyes on what's eternal and lasting. Help us. We love you. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Rise your feet as a time of invitation together. You come now as the Spirit of God leads you.